it's like trying to break into Hollywood, really. I mean, what producer is going to give you the money? <laughs> it really is. And so it, it was tough. It was heartbreaking for um, me to go through the NBA draft process. And here I was, a proven player, 18 and 12, 18 points, 12 rebounds a game my senior year in college. And you sit there and you realize that you're not even on anyone's radar because it's almost like kids at Christmas in that one GM doesn't want you until another GM wants you. If they don't want you, they're safe to overlook you because you'll never be given the chance to shine and make them look bad for passing yeah. over you. Yeah. So therefore, they don't want to have to answer to an owner for that. And so it's, it becomes very much a game of um, boys with toys, I guess, and uh, it becomes very political. And you realize it's a business. It's not... It's not all about basketball, it's not fun and games. It is the entertainment business down to the core. In Europe, it's a little more lively. And so, I mean, it, 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 we'll see what happens there. And, but when I did summer camp with the Clippers, I mean, I did everything I could with what they gave me. But it's just, you know, fighting the powers that be. I mean, you could play the most brilliant game of all time, but they pretty much have already made up their minds before camp has even started who's going to play and who's going to get the recognition and their attention. And, you know, I enjoyed the time they gave me. I learned a lot. And, but they basically said, you know, you're, this isn't your home. And so I had to go over that year to start out in Turkey, my professional year, my first year as a professional, as a rookie. I signed a pretty good contract as a rookie in Turkey. But, uh, Turks don't pay. I hate to generalize like that, but that's basically, that was the, the stereotype they had before I went and the stereotype they still have long after I've left. And, you know, just because you sign a contract in Turkey for this amount of money doesn't really mean anything. That only means that's the most they're going to pay you. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a tough go. And plus also because Turkey doesn't have a player union. And when you're not a citizen of that country, what are you going to do? Right. And so I remember I was there for six weeks, and they hadn't paid me. And so I finally knocked on their door, and I said, uh, I'm sorry. I finally went and said to them, hey, if you don't pay me, I'm not playing the game tomorrow. And they came and knocked on my door, and they said, okay, Lance, we're taking you to the airport. I mean, what am I going to do? And so it, it's, it's important that people know that basketball is not all glitz and glamour and fun. The media focuses on so much of the longevity players with these huge contracts that people get this conception that it's all glitz and glamour. It's not. Let me, I want the audience, Lance, to know who you really are. Your first contract was $20,000, or the first serial payment mm -hmm. of the $90,000 contract mm -hmm. sure. was $20,000. What did you do with that money? I took a loan out against it and gave it to mom and dad so they could pay off some of their debts and help my sister pay for her wedding. Wow. You know. I would like to think anyone else would have done the same thing had they had parents like mine. And I think that's right. I've met your parents. I'll talk to your parents. They seem to be the most wonderful people. They are. But I must say, they couldn't have a finer son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Kenny Maine, in the introduction to your book, writes that the average fan has totally lost perspective on what it takes to make it to the NBA. I have a different question, Lance. What if you hadn't made it? Would I have gotten to the point where I am and where I'm at now? In that, sure, I was called up, and Cleveland gave signed me for the rest of the season, but. Was I really given an opportunity while I was there? Not really. But was I able to finally say I got there? Yeah. But seeing what I saw in Cleveland helped me gain perspective that, again, it's just a business. And so much of it is about timing. And at the end of the day, the only person that's going to validate me is me. And that is, without doubt, the toughest lesson I've ever had to learn in life. 
because so many people need other people to validate them, to acknowledge the price and cost that they have paid in life to get where they are and what they have done. But that usually the people that you most want to validate you are the ones that will never validate That you. never do it. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.